And my mom, before she died, Dr. Richard, my sister asked her this question. Mom, you were a school teacher all your life, adult life. If you could have done anything else other than teach, what would that be? And my mom, without skipping a beat, Dr. Richard said this to her. I wanted to be a nurse. And that nurse died in my mom and went to the graveyard. And I was committed that the graveyard was no longer going to get my riches, my dream. Hello and welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. Food for the brain, knowledge from the experts, tools to win at life. I'm your host, Dr. Richard. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you do, this is the show that is going to help you become the best version of yourself. Each episode, you will hear from some of the most amazing, talented, and successful people on the planet who followed their passions and strive to help others. Join our movement to get a million people each day to commit acts of kindness for others. Together, we're going to make the world a better place. Are you ready? Because it's time for your daily helping. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Daily Helping Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard, and this episode's guest is really interesting. Kingsley Grant is an international motivational speaker, corporate trainer, licensed marriage and family therapist, career transition coach, and online radio podcaster. He is also a published author. Kingsley focuses on helping aspiring entrepreneurs cut through the confusion, and take the next logical step toward their dream career. Kingsley is a contributing writer for the Huffington Post, Addicted to Success, Thrive Global, and The Good Men Project. He is a proud dad, husband, man of faith, and an entrepreneur at heart. He is the president of Helping Families Improve Incorporated, a company driven on improving communication within relationships. Kingsley, welcome to the show. That's Richard. It's an honor being here with you, and I am so stoked of this opportunity. Well, we're grateful that you're here for sure. And as you know, I love having guests on that have really unique and interesting stories to share. And yours is no exception to that. So what I would love for you to do is share with us your journey from your beginnings to where you are now. Sure. You know, I want to say thank you again because, you know, listening to your show and hear all the guests you have on there, I really also like the fact of the way you take the conversation because I believe you're, you're doing a great service to your community the way you do that. So I, so I really appreciate the opportunity basically to kind of share what it is that have led me to where I am. And thank you for asking that question because I find that for me, coming from a, a place where I never thought that I would be doing what I'm doing today. I had so many, I call myself a late starter, number one. <laughs> and number two, I, you know, I said to myself, I never had the opportunity some people had. And, and therefore, I really kind of um, looked at how can I ever do this? And, you know, coming from Jamaica, where I was born and raised, but I came here almost 40 years ago to the United, United States and really had a, a very challenging time because I really never had family members here to help me. So I really had to kind of fend for myself earlier on and make this work. And, you know, through the years, of course, different aspects of your journey, you went to school, all the different things like that. And then I went to work through some issues of my past where I really had to kind of wrestle through, walk through those, because I realized that all these things could be a barrier to my journey. So I did all of that. And then, of course, when you fast forward, I, you know, begin to find my way and realize that, okay, there's something more that I have to do in life. And I realized that later in life, and I made that transition from a basically a nine to five kind of setting to really say, hey, you know what? To do what I need to do, I need to be behind the wheel of my life. And I did that in 2008. And no doubt, you said you were kind of a late bloomer, which I'm sure was the inspiration <laughs> for your book, yes. The Midlife Launch, which we're definitely going to talk about it. So talk about, you said you've been here for 40 years, which I think makes you kind of official at that point. But let's talk about your journey coming from Jamaica and, and what that was like exactly for you. It was, like I mentioned before, to, to get into the culture, it was a cultural shock. Because for me, 
not realizing, you know, of course, Jamaica, a very small country, and coming here, growing up, growing up in a very conservative family, and have a chance now to be on my own, basically, and do my own life, I realized I was like a kid in a candy store, you know, everything was seemed so like, wow, you know, and, and now I got lost in the shuffle, Dr. Richard, that I, I figure, you know, I'm going to have to figure this out because I didn't have the guidance that some people do, the adults in your life surrounding you to share with you, okay, do this, do that. I had to figure a lot of those things out. And for me, really not having my parents, of course, with me here, I just didn't have that, that anchor, that, that foundation. So I just kind of got myself into as many things as I could possibly do. Reckless living, just really just being rebellious and doing everything I felt just to make myself fit in, you know, because I felt I didn't do it very fast. And so I really grabbed at everything that came my way. And of course, many of those things cost me dearly, of course, financially and otherwise setting me back big time. But, you know, of course, like anything as you learn. And so for me, I really had to struggle with finding myself because who I was, that was a lost piece. I really didn't know who I was anymore because I tried to be everything that I saw that I needed to become just to be cool and popular. And that really kind of set me back even more, <laughs> not only a late boom bloomer, but it set me back even more because I now had to make up grounds after all those wasted years of doing just, you know, things that my friends were doing and just, you know, partying and having fun and all that stuff. And it's kind of put everything by the wayside, you know, and it, it really kind of cost me. It's interesting. And you've mentioned a couple of times that that cost you. And it, and it sounds like from your perspective, what you were missing was mentorship and guidance while you were doing all of these things that were detrimental to your development. Very much so. I, I found myself that I really didn't have any kind of guidance. And I, looking back, and of course, 2020, is, you know, hindsight is always 2020. I, I wish I knew some things then, which you never can know until you live the life. But I wish I had an adult, somebody who could mentor me, who I really looked up to that I wanted to become like, and who would actually allow me to enter their space and learn from them. I really never had that. And therefore, I was kind of floundering trying my best at that very young age to find what might be my course, my, my direction in life. And that really kind of eluded me for a very, very long time. And that's why I mentioned before, I spent a lot of money doing that, figuring, figuring that thing out, figuring those things out. And on time, of course, and just really job to job, you know, went to school and all that, but just kind of not take it very seriously because, I, of course, I was, you know, invincible, young and foolish. <laughs> but I really learned and would not have it any other way because I've learned some very, very valuable lessons that have really helped me even now in my life. What would you say, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here, Kingsley, what would you say is the most valuable lesson that you've learned? I think my most valuable lesson is the lesson of forgiveness. I really had to learn that later on in life because I had an incident in my early childhood, my young, as a young teenager, where I was molested. And for 20 years, I really did not give voice to that. I really kept that to myself. And in coming here, it was many years after I was here that I really came to terms with that. I'm able to talk about those things. And that is, I think, one of the biggest things that I believe really um, st stood out to me where I said, felt like, this is one lesson that I've learned, and I realize this is one thing I need to do for myself is forgive the person who did that to me. And that happened here in the United States. And really, I look back that, you know, that was a big launch for my life when I really let go of that past um, hurt. What caused you to have that realization that you needed to forgive the individual that molested you? What, what put you down that path? Well, the two things I believe first is my relationship with God. That really did a, a work in my life where I realized I need to, uh, for my own self, forgive. And, and secondly, I met so many people who had how many, I mean, hurts and pains and, and just wandering through life. And I realized that can't be me. So when I went to school and began to study in, um, in psychology, of course, in my degree, I realized also that this might be the thing. And it's interesting that I went in that path because I realized now I help so many people themselves walk through their own trauma in their lives. But I, it helped me realize some things that I need to look at differently 
and look at causation and all those different things. Like this didn't just happen to me. It could also happen for me. And I was able to make a case for this person and really realize he also may have gone through himself that kind of path, I mean, path that he really incurred on my life. And so really walking through that, processing that over a very long period of time, I came to a place where I said, you know, for my sake, I need to let this person go. And I did. That's powerful, Kingsley. And it's powerful because not only were you able to let it go, but what you said really resonated with me that you basically said that this might have happened to that person. You, you have empathy for the person who did this to you, even though it was so horrible that understanding that you don't know what they went through either. And I think that's really incredible. You know, that's what Richard, how I look at it this way, and I've, of course, come to this realization later in life, but it wasn't always this way, because there's a story that I created around that incident, and I made a case, a very strong case, not just about the facts, but as, as to my story of how I, you know, looked at things and made a case against this person. And really, along this kind of um, shrink all this in a very short, uh, summarized way, I, I wrote a book about the very same thing called Two Steps, Two Steps of Forgiveness, that you have to do a physical and an emotional. And that came out of my own experience because I realized that I had to now make a case for him. And the case for him was to let him off and no longer persecute, I mean, prosecute him the way I was. And I realized if I put that narrative in place that he himself could have gone through, that helped me re- feel empathetic like you described so well for him. And that was, a, was revolutionary for me. That's amazing. And and I know that this happened and then some other major things were going on in your career as well. That you know, you didn't just float around, you you got a job and you worked for a really long time. Yes. But then you had enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did that to Richard. I really after twenty one years of in one place, I realized that okay, you know, you get to that stage of life and you're wondering, is this all there is to life? And I realized there's got to be more than this. And so in 2008, actually 2006 and halfway in that year, I began to feel very kind of fidgety. And, and I started to tell my wife, you know, I really feel that I need to be doing something else. I, I have something burning inside of me. But I was scared. I really, you know, after we felt so comfortable for many years, I could really talk myself a good game about why I should stay and why I should never leave because this is so feels so secure and all that different things. And I realized, Dr. Richard, that I could stay there in my misery and feel comfortable, or I could leave and take a chance of fulfilling my dream and not looking back and regretting this one thing that I never lived out my dream. And in 2008, I resigned from my position. Six months later, I had my I was on the hospital bed with my chest wide open, having a quadruple bypass surgery. And I'm thinking, this can't be for real. Here it is after my longevity in this one place that now I'm about to launch my my career in the area of uh, of choice. And then I have a heart attack. And six months, and you know, six months after that, I was my chest is pretty open. I'm thinking, this is crazy. I said, what the, what's going on here? But anyway, long story short, I recovered from that. But I was determined that this was something I had to do. And in 2011, my mom died of cancer, which now is another major milestone for me. And my mom, before she died, Dr. Richard, my sister asked her this question. Mom, you're a school teacher all your life, adult life. If you could have done anything else other than teach, what would that be? And my mom, without skipping a beat, Dr. Richard said this to her, I wanted to be a nurse. And that nurse died in my mom and went to the graveyard. And I was committed that the graveyard was no longer going to get my riches, my dream. And I made a commitment to myself and to others. We need to rob the graveyard of any future riches by living out our dream and pursuing it with all that we have. And that has been my my one direction in life where I'm not looking back, I want to not only fulfill for myself, but for everyone that I have a chance to influence in some way or the other. It's amazing. And essentially, you know, the old adage, you know, it's, it's never too late. You're, you're the picture of that. I mean, you went 
back to school. I know from your website, you've got your master's degree. You graduated cum laude at the age of 47, which is you know about 24 years older than most people who probably were sitting in your classes with you, <laughs> yes. but, but you did it. And so now tell me how today with these experiences, with what you learned, having a close call there with the quadruple bypass and, and your mom's passing, how are you helping others who might be too afraid to make that leap? How are you helping them with make that transition and follow their dreams? You know, I think you did a, a very good job in, in framing that question because you kind of brought in to the fact my experience. And that's the key, the kickoff spot for me, Dr. Richard. I tell people many times, you have a life experience. You have learned some things along the way. You did not learn and pay the price for that to now stop doing. You have something that somebody is waiting for, and only you can deliver that. So I inspire people basically to do their best and be their best. Because I believe that everyone has a potential to be able to change the world one dream at a time. And if I'm doing what I'm called to do and you're doing what you're called to do, collectively we can make a difference. So I really do to my, my speaking, my coaching, my writing. One thing is always true about that. I want to inspire people to be their best and do their best by pursuing their dream and finding a way to fulfill that. And that's what I do and I try to do basically in all that I in all that I do. So let's say you come across me and I come into your office and I'm this guy who's been where you were, working at a job for 20 years, terrified because it's paying my mortgage and you know allowing us to do the things that we're doing within our family. What's the first step that you would say to that person who needs to break free from where they're at to start their entrepreneurial journey or whatever their path might be? The first step I will say is let's look at your story. What story is driving you? Because what happened is the story shapes everything that we do, either good or bad. And, and most times they're where they're at because the story that's going on in their head is what's keeping them from taking that, that step. And it creates all kinds of limitations, scarcity, you know, the imposter syndrome, you name it, comes out of that one place. So what I do is help them to reframe their story to work for them rather than against them. This liberates them. This opens a door for them to actually go in and now enter that room that they can begin to look around and say, how can I now take that one thing I have discovered and take it to the world? So I walk them through a framework beginning with their story. If I can get the right, if I can script the right story, I find that begin to give them a sense of hope. Oh, I've never thought about that. I can see. And those kind of expressions really help them to realize, you know, it might be possible. So I begin with that one first phase of conversation. I know that you've mentioned that you've actually developed your own framework and methodology that you're using. It's called the smooth framework, if I understand. Could you walk us through that? I think we started with the first one. Is that for, sto for story? Yes, you're right. Is a script the right, <laughs> is script the right story, and that's what I just um, did, and I find that that's really the foundational piece. But once you've done that, it's it's good you have that. But now you're going to create a mission. So it's a going to map a mission, which is your your why. And I believe that the why. You know, Simon Sinek wrote a book about you know start with why, which is great, and I think it's you know a wonderful book and all the different things. But I believe the why have to have legs to that. The legs is a mission. It's a thing that you are saying, I know what I've been called to do. So we help people to create, to identify what is a big thing that transcends them, that really lives beyond them, that they want to pursue. So we have to shape that. So I call that mapping the mission that they now to be, need to be on. When those things happen, here's a, the problem. It now creates for them a sense of, okay, what about? What about this? What about that? So I call those the obstacles that they now have to overcome. And they could be perceived or they could be real. So sometimes they're real obstacles. But most times, Dr. Richard, as you might know, of course, as a psychologist, you know this, most times they're perceived. They're not really real. And I love what uh, Jack Canfield, you know, the chicken soup of the soul writer, he said, you know, fear is fantasizing experiences appearing real. 
So they fantasize about those things and they become obstacles to their life. So we have to overcome those things. But what I find is wonderful to say, let's overcome that. But if we don't have something to put in place to take the space of that obstacle, then it will be to, to, to not. So I said, okay, let's look at the options. So I said, let's open all the options that are possible with where you are, with, with what has happened to your life. What could be some alternatives? What are some other things you can look at that you may not have considered to be a possibility of moving from where you are to where you want to go? And most times when I sit down with somebody and begin to ask them those questions, they're like, oh, I could do that. Oh, okay. I could do and begin to like start in the flow. And before long, they have all these options available to them that they never thought about. Why? Because the story is now have positioned them to what they are now going after. They have a mission. And the third thing is not only open the options. Here's a problem they'll say now, Dr. Richard, is that where do I find the time? I really don't have the time. And they begin to find all the reasons why. And I say, okay. Can you trim the time? Can you look at something you could do to cut back or gain, you get, gain five minutes here, 10 minutes there? And most times it's available. They just don't look at it. So they trim the time to find a way to really make it work and fit something in so they can take an action step, which is the H, which is the big part here. And I call it the hole in one. Hit that hole in one. I'm not a golfer. I don't know if you are, Dr. Richard, but I'm not. <laughs> My biggest golf game, I swung at the golf ball, and I the, that golf club was all in the air, and the ball was right where it le- it was it, at my feet. So I'm not a great golfer. But the term is simply saying, how can I quickly get the ball from where it's at into the hole and shrink the, the process? So I want to give them a quick win, which is let's now find which of those options we could take, call an action step, create an action step around that, and get going, and then we can evaluate and see how that works, and we do it all over again. And I find that that framework moves people from where they're at to where they need to go real quickly, and they feel like they can manage that. It's not me telling them what to do. They have now discovered on their own what they could do based upon their strength and their experiences. All right, so let me let me bring it all home, and I, I'm a huge fan of acronyms, so this is a great one. So the S is for scripting your story. The M is for mapping your mission. O is obstacles to overcome. O is for being open to options. T is for trimming the time. And H is nailing that hole in one. Yes. Awesome. I love that. Thank you. I I love that. And as you've been doing this, so it seems like your story, not your story in terms of the trauma you went through, but your story about basically saying to yourself, I'm, I'm changing gears here, uh, is becoming an increasingly common thing these days. You hear more and more people that, that are taking that leap. And I think the one thing that, that really stood out to me is the trimming the time, because I think so many people are so caught up in our life and if you'll recall, probably about 20 years ago, Bill Gates was talking about, you know, in the next 15 to 20 years, we're going to have, you know, automation and robots and all of these amazing things. And we're going to have more time than ever before. But in fact, what the research shows is that with all of these distractions in our life, most people perceive that they have less time than ever before. So in our technological, fast-paced world, Share with us some of those tips, some of the things that people can do so that they can find that time. You know, I tell people many times, we have, all of us have 24 hours. We have 168 hours for the week. And if we take out, you know, eight hours sleep, five day, eight hour work day, we are left with basically like 72 hours thereabouts. And if you take out, you know, you become very kind of a, You know, just say, okay, let's put in time you want to spend with family and so on. You have all those hours remaining. What do you do with those hours? So what I find is I was giving a talk recently to this group of uh, women business owners, and they were talking about productivity. That's what they tasked me to speak about that. And I use a framework idea to say, how can you be more productive? And one of the points I make was this, that you you, you earn the right 
to use social media. And what I meant by that was, what if you decide that you're not going to want to get on social media unless it's bi- your business calls for it right away, but in the morning, and you do one or two, one to three things that you say, I must get these things done today, and then I'll reward myself with social media after I've done that. Well, that's trimming the time. You're really giving yourself a chance to then get, be more productive. Secondly, the idea I find is if a person can get up even half an hour earlier than they're getting up right now, or 15 minutes, that 15 minutes or half an hour can really, you add that up over a you know five, seven day a week, they really could use, get a lot done in that time. So they could really trim time to make that happen. Television, watching television. Well, watch one less show. So there's a number of ways that we could practically do this. And I find if people are willing to say, hey, my dream is worth this, then I can put aside two or three hours or 10 hours per week just to get my dream accomplished. Outstanding. And I want to jump back to something we talked about earlier because I love the way that you phrased it. Let's talk a little bit more about cutting through the confusion. Sure. You know, here's the thing I find, Dr. Richard. You know, not only are people overwhelmed, and you described it so well just now when you mentioned about the technology and all the different things that are happening. But I find people that I, I work with, there's so much available technology and information overload that they're confused. It's not that they don't know where know what to do. They just don't know where to start because the, people are, are putting at every angle and telling them, do this, do that. And they're like, ah, stop. So I'm saying, okay, what if we can cut through that confusion? And that's why even the this, this smooth framework helps to do that very same thing. It's to put, sit down and let us walk through the process because they're so confused that they just become paralyzed. It's almost analysis paralysis or the other way around. They just don't know. They're freeze, you know, so they're going to fight, flight, freeze mode, and they just don't act on anything because they're so confused. And the confusion is about where do I start? There's so many things beckoning for my, 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 my time and my, you know, and for, and for me, I'm just so confused. I just speak to her lady just recently. I'm working with her and she said, Kingsley, I don't know where to start. Help me. And it's a very bright lady, very well researched. I mean, she's a you know a professional, but she said, "I don't know where to start." And it's not that she's she's not smart; she's very smart. But again, the noise is so loud, she doesn't know how to dial it that down, turn it down, and pick a lane to drive in. That's where I come in to help people like that. Awesome! I, I love the way that you put that. It makes perfect sense. And no doubt you've pulled some of those strategies you use to cut through the confusion into your book, The Midlife Launch. Tell us a little bit about that book. You know, when, when I wrote this book, I really thought about my life, like you said so you know, well earlier. And I, I, I thought about my own life because I really launched myself at midlife and I wanted to successful, successfully pursue my dream. But here's the thing I find that many people who are in that state or that place they don't want to risk too much. They don't want to give up. If it's going to cost them too much, they are reluctant to get started. They want to know, can I do this at the least, you know, in the most cost-effective way? And can I do this without risking too much? So that was me. And I felt like this book served that purpose to help people to walk through, how can you launch? How can you go after your dream without giving up what's most important to you? And every person can determine what's most important to them. So it could be family, it could be money, it could be a savings, whatever that is, I'm saying there's a way to do that without risking everything. So this book is basically uh, framed around the idea of working through family discussions, friendship discussions and relationships around fear, uh, you have overcome fear, is the idea of... um, you know, the whole responsibility. I have so much responsibility. I say, yes, that's fine. But don't you have a responsibility to take a message to a world that you have been given to to impact? So yes, I don't disregard or dismiss your responsibility. If I had the cure for cancer, and I'm thinking that I'm not going to only keep that for my family because I have a responsibility to take that 
to others who also are suffering from cancer. And so I find when people can realize that they have, can make an impact, they've been placed on this earth to do a large thing and make an impact worldwide, somehow that tends to catapult them to like, wait a minute, I can do this. And I find that this book really helps to set them up to move in that direction to say, hey, I can change my world that I've been given, given to to make an impact on. And I find that when people understand those things, it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. You are absolutely 100% singing my song. And in fact, the whole premise of this show, as you know, is about people finding out what they're passionate about and going after those things to make the world a better place and help others. So I love what you're saying there, Kingsley. And no doubt that your book is a great read, and we'll have a link to that in our show notes and in the Daily Helping app. Uh, And I know we've talked a lot about story. Story has been a consistent theme of this episode, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about something that you shared with me in terms of your background, and that you are a Sherpa. And I think probably most people don't know what a Sherpa is. So if you wouldn't mind, talk to us a little bit about what is a Sherpa, and how that informs what you do today. Dr. Richard, that's a very good um, insight on your part because our observation. And because so many people skip over that, they hear the word coach and mentor a lot, and they immediately have a picture of what it looks like. But I find myself, a Sherpa is really somebody who says, we're going to get on this terrain, on this place that you don't know much about. I've been there. But I know where to navigate to avoid the minefields that would, you know, be there and blow up in your face. So I'm going to walk you through this process to where you want to go. But I want to only be a few steps ahead of you. I'm not going to be so far you can't see me. I'm not going to be where you can't reach me. I'll be within reach. So a Sherpa is that person who really is carefully walking that person through the minefield, navigating those, those landmines and getting them safely to the other side, but staying close enough where they're always in sight, where sometimes a person with a coach might be so far removed or a a mentor might be unavailable during those times. I find being a Sherpa for me makes it so much more close to home and easier for a, a person to really say, hey, you know what? At least you're there and I feel safe and I feel like I can do this type of thing. Yeah, so that's why I, I like to call myself a Sherpa more so than anything else. And a Sherpa is literally a guide who physically guides people across terrains like mountains and things like that. So very cool. And then again, I I love the way that you're applying this to your own work because essentially you're, you're there and the people you're helping know that you're there, but you're not holding their hand either, babying them. You're actually, you know, they're making the changes. They're doing the work themselves. And that's the cool part about it. I think that's so spot on is that they are the ones empowered to do the work. They're walking this journey and you're just saying, hey, I'm right here. It's okay. Come. This is a path you need to go through. And so I I find that people feel at least safer and they realize it's not great as great a risk as if they're left on their own. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Kingsley, I want to, before we wrap up here, I do want to talk a little bit about your organization, Helping Families Improve Incorporated. Talk to us a little bit about that and the work you do there. Yeah, Helping Families Improve is basically the, the arm of the therapeutic work I, I, I do with people and is to help them basically walk through relational issues. And I find it to be such more a broader thing even nowadays because what happened is the families I work with and also some now the organizations they're looking for interpersonal skills. How can we communicate more effectively that we can actually create more of a harmonious environment whether at home or in the workplace? And so what Helping Families Improve intended was, was to help all the families, but it's also branched out. But it's really, I my goal, my dream is that people get along, find a way to make it work. And I believe it's possible if each person takes a step back, tweak some things about what they do, and realize that, you know what, we can come to a place where we can be both satisfied with the outcome. And I'm more about the idea of saying, hey, here is how it can work. You give a little, you give a little. You won't both have all that you want, but the relationship will have all that it needs. Beautiful. I love the way that you put that. 
Well, we are just about at time here, Kingsley. And as you know, I like to wrap up my show by asking all of my guests their biggest helping. That is the single most important piece of information for somebody to walk away with after hearing you on today's episode. And I would say it's this, pursue your dream. Don't let the graveyard become richer because your dream was not lived out. Don't live your life with that which is within you Hold in it back. The world awaits. The world hold is, holds its breath awaiting you to take your dream to it. Let's go do it today. Absolutely perfect. I love it. Kingsley, where can people find you? The best place is kingsleygrant.com. K-I-N-G-S-L-E-Y-G-R-A-N-T. Kingsleygrant.com. All my information is there. Perfect. And again, for those of you who are driving about, we will also have all of Kingsley's information and links in the Daily Helping app and in the show notes as well. Kingsley, thank you again for being on the show. It was terrific. And I know that everybody's going to get a lot out of what you had to share with us today. And for those of you listening at home, thank you for tuning into this episode of the show. If you like what you heard, go subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a five-star review. This is what helps others find the podcast. Most importantly, though, go out there and do something nice for somebody else today, even if you don't know who they are, and post it in your feeds using hashtag my daily helping because the happiest people are those that help others until next time